The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, am I live? Okay, well, welcome to the third in our series of talks on artificial intelligence and machine learning. This is a series co sponsored by Metron and George Mason University. And the goal of the series is to get us. Uh, more educated, more knowledgeable about these exciting developments in AI and, and machine learning. So our speaker today will be Professor Alexander Bayen from the University of California, Berkeley. But let me detour from that for a minute to remind you that there are two more talks. Hi, Kathy. Two, 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 two more talks uh, uh, in this series, and they're both taking place. Actually, there are three, but there's two talks taking place next week. On Tuesday, uh, Dimitri Bursimus is going to give us a talk on explainable AI. And on Friday, uh, Nick Polson will give us a talk. And I, the rumor is that it's going to be on his book, AIQ, which is how men and machines are smarter together. Uh, Professor Bayen is the Liat Cho Professor of Engineering at UC Berkeley. He's a professor of electrical engineering and computer science and civil and environmental engineering. He's currently the director of the Institute for Transportation Studies. He's also a faculty scientist at the, uh, at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He received an engineering degree in, in applied math from the Ecole Polytechnique in France in 1998, a master's and PhD in aeronautics and ast astronautics from Stanford University in 98 and 99. He was a visiting researcher at NASA Ames Research Center from 2000 to 2003. From January to December 2004, he worked as the research director of the Autonomous Navigation Laboratory at the Laboratoire de Recherche Balistique et Aerodynamique. Good job, my apologies. He's <laughs> been on the faculty at UC Berkeley since 2005, has authored two books and over 200 articles. Professor Bayer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Larry, for the very generous introduction. Um, it's really fun and a pleasure to be here. Um, to be here and work with some people again, Craig reminded me last night that uh, we actually wrote proposals together. Hopefully there will be more in the future. I'm really grateful for the hospitality. Thank you, Vadim, for uh, making this possible through uh, GMU. And a final remark before I dive in, um, I have never seen an executive office with as many science books. So I'm really excited about <laughs> this company. Um, so we're going to have two parts of the talk. Uh, the first part will be a kind of a high altitude flight with a few deep dives into uh, large scale mobility. Um, with a lot of, uh, a few deep dives into some of the mathematics of it. And in the second part of the talk will be a lot more applied, but also investigating things which are still moving and open, such as deep reinforcement learning. Um, so let me uh, move forward with the uh, outline of the talk. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about inference problems, not do too deep uh, dives here, and then go deeper into the sort of genius game part. There's a lot of overlap in the sense of, uh, of this world with, uh, what's done here in, in France, and in a sense, it does represent a lot of the work we did about 10 years ago um, that we have now pushed to the private sector. So I think it's a nice overlap, 
this is more in motion as well in the sense that I think uh, the, the frontier, both the scientific and, and technical frontier is still working and moving. A lot of you have done control theory estimation as part of your daily job. So you've seen this if you are at Caltech and you take a control class usually from Richard Murray's book. That's the way you explain to an engineer how controls, control works. Um, and what I'd like to do is visit the mobility system in light of a, the eyes of a control theorist uh, to show where the gaps are and, 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 and what contributions can be made. So at the core, there's always a system, a physical system, whether it's an aircraft or financial system, if it's more virtual, um, which in mathematical terms, you know, essentially you're modeling something like this or some more um, arterial um, uh, streets. And here there's about half a century of, uh, there's half a century of, oops, okay, that's, I'm still learning the new pointer here. I might have to do both at the same time. Sure. Okay. Um, so there's about half a century of, of work to model traffic. And, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is first because we had our own contribution there, but mostly because that's kind of something we can rely on without having to redo it from scratch. Um, of course, um, and you do a lot of estimation and inference, um, at the core of um, uh, any system, you have to do sensing. And in the case of mobility, until recently, sensing was pretty much uh, very, very thin. I mean, there was not much at the disposal of engineers. Uh, loop detectors, cameras, radars, fast track responders, tubes, which is like Jurassic Park, really. Um, and, uh, and, and you can imagine, it's, if you're a public agency, it's uh, extremely expensive, it, it fails, so it's, it's, it's very partial, and it's not, it's not, it was not doing a very good job, um, uh, really, throughout history. And if you look at the control part, it's not better in the sense that if you think about controlling traffic, okay, you have traffic lights, you have uh, sometimes metering lights to improve freeway flow or bridging uh, metering. If you're really advanced, maybe you have lane by lane guidance. But if you think about controlling something like this, which is a test bed we have in District 7 in um, California, it's, it's really small. This is the I-210 corridor. It's about uh, 20 kilometers over five, 10-ish. Um, there's hundreds of thousands of people who live there, go through there every day, and you have essentially 500 assets to control that entire corridor, which, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that's really not sufficient. Um, but that's the reality of control today uh, for mobility, because there's not much else you can do. Um, now, when you do control, and that's maybe where it touches you all a bit closer, um, you need to do estimation, or sometimes called inference, or nowcast, and then you need to do prediction, or sometimes referred to as forecast. Um, which has been really changed and, and revolutionized and disturbed over the last decade, and we had some part in it. Um, and that's going to be the first part of the story, short, not, not too much in depth because it's more past, but it's certainly changed the state of the art. So, for example, this is the interface of a decision support system we're building at Berkeley for District 7. And what it does is it provides some form of forecast of demand. So you can see at the on ramp, um, you know, the flow is going up in the morning, and then there's a kind of a break in the middle of the day, then rush hour in the evening, and then back down. Uh, so that's an example of demand, and that can be you know, predicted quite well with RMAX models and, and simple models. And then there's um, nowcast, which is usually represented in the form of time-space diagrams. So time-space diagram is the basic tool of the traffic engineer. It represents, uh, by a certain color or level, the, the amount of congestion. So red is bad, green is good, throughout time. And at the end of the day, the whole thing is filled, and you have a whole square filled with color, and you can see how you're free with it. And, um, so uh, demand forecast is essentially the ability to predict and, um, and now cast to estimate um, the state of the system now. That all goes into an optimizer, no, um, no surprise here. Um, what, and optimizer, I mean, what is optimal? That's a pretty big philosophical question. You could imagine freeway is all green. It's actually not. Uh, oops. It's not um, always the case um, that it happens to be the optimal, but anyway, there's an objective function, whatever it is, you define it, and you try to achieve it. And of course, when you do that, that gets fed uh, through an interface, so a lot of you have worked in air traffic control um, through um, either metro navigation or other work, and so ground traffic control is not that different in that there is also a command center, this is District 7's uh, command center, um, and then there's an equivalent at the local MPO. If you've seen the movie The Italian Job, that's the place that gets hacked. Okay. Um, and that, screen is, that screenshot is, could be from the real place or from the movie because the movie guys did such a good job that they actually bought the software to, look, to make it look like in the District 7 uh, place. Now, one thing which is important to keep in mind is that when you optimize, 
Um, so there's always going to be a human in the loop. And in aviation, it's common. In ground traffic, it's also common. And you could think, why is that? Um, there's not safety critical here, but that's just part of managing your infrastructure. The human will not get out of the control room, even in ground traffic. And, but in addition to that, there's also a bunch of rules. And it's the same as in air traffic. That you can't do anything. You, you, there are floors on which you can fly. There's climb altitudes you can reach, and some you shouldn't. Um, ground traffic is similar. There's a concept of operations. That's the way it's called. It's a form of contract between the different cities that populate that jurisdiction. And in the particular case of LA, we wrote it. And that's essentially, if you look at this in terms of optimization, you should look at this at your optimization feasible set. It's like anything in this is legal. Anything not in this is not legal. Not in the legal term of the word, the word but more in the term of what cities will agree to do with each other. Um, so let's talk a little bit about inference problems. So that's the general framework. Um, so, uh, for both uh, forecast and estimation. Um, so, one thing which is interesting, which is in the process of completely disrupting, uh, disrupting the mobility industry, is the ability for people to do very rough forecast of mobility at large scale using cell tower data. Cell tower data, as you know, is very different from GPS. Uh, location is pretty poor. It's within 250 to 500 meters. Um, it's also pretty approximate. The update rate is very infrequent. So it's bad if you want to uh, now cast traffic. Uh, companies have failed and failed over with this for decades. Uh, but it's actually very good if you want to forecast that you know, there will be 500 people coming into the three buildings around this building between 8 p.m. and 8, 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. Um, and so part of what we did a few years ago was to come up with some of the first algorithms to do that. And so one of the problem in planning is, can you do OD, origin destination, um, uh, now cast and forecast? So could you say from this polygon around that tower, there is a 500, 1,000, a couple thousand people going to that other polygon at a given time, and could you train models to do forecast? Um, and if you think about a company like AT&T, but five years ago, they already had 40% of the California population. So data is centralized. Essentially, if you have one company you're working with, you can probably do that. Um, and 40% will be good enough to, to extrapolate for the rest of the population without committing too many uh, errors. And so typically, for these types of problems, I'm not going to go in depth here. We'll, we'll dip a few deeper deep dives later. But what's really nice is that you can pose these problems using simple convex optimization approaches where you know, you minimize a smooth uh, quadratic function, you can regularize it, and, and, and it works really well, and it works well at scale. So part of our work there was to try to demonstrate that with that kind of crappy data, you, you can do a pretty good job. So this is an example of CDR data. This is not GPS data. Um, you can see, for example, this is a traveler along that freeway, and clearly he's not doing an exit here. It just happens to talk to a tower that is further away from the freeway. So you can see why it's good for demand modeling. It's not good for traffic forecast. Uh, this is an example of a FedEx truck doing deliveries and pickups. Uh, this is someone going to work, stopping for lunch, going back to work, going home. So you can infer a bunch of things at kind of a, um, a large scale, um, but it's not for local. It's really more for global. Um, and with that, you can feed models, for example, uh, origin destination models that will uh, essentially predict now, infer or predict, depending on what you want to do with it, um, the relative flows from any origin to any destination and commonly referred to as TAS, traffic assignment zones uh, in transportation engineering. There's a lot of convex optimization models that enable us to do that pretty rapidly. Um, and you can assess the efficiency, how many towers, how many people you need to make it accurate, and I'm not going to go into details here. So um, another thing uh, with uh, state estimation is work done with GPS data. Now, GPS data completely changed mobility over the last decade. It's insane to the point that it almost created a bunch of Frankensteins that now um, uh, public agencies have to deal with. And that's the meat of the first part of the talk. So uh, in state estimation, uh, the emergence of the phone has enabled amazing things. So going back to this uh, state uh, space <coughs> diagram, so time space diagram, the goal in traffic engineering is essentially at any given time to have a perfect information along any of these lines. If it's noon, if you know the color along this uh, line here, you know the speed everywhere. And that's what gets displayed on your phone. Uh, so when Google gives you driving, driving information, essentially it queries link by link the, the speed, and that's how it computes your travel time, and that's how it routes you. So imagine you did not know anything about this, and you were trying to infer it. 
Um, we came up with a lot of methods about 10 years ago to do that. One was with particle filtering, and that was the conversation this morning with Larry, um, using discretized um, models using, uh, with uh, hyperbolic first order conservation laws, which are essentially gas dynamics laws that are applied to traffic as well. What I'm going to show here is another uh, method which uses convex optimization using Hamilton Jacobi equation, which is a higher level equation, uh, which is essentially a primitive function to the conservation laws. So, first, let's talk about the data. If you are measuring traffic at a given location, essentially you can sample the data along this line. At any time, you can see the data and you can measure it in there. And if your sensor fails, well, then you have no data during that time period. If you knew what data was like at midnight, usually the freeway is nearly empty, you can probably reset your model. So that means you can have a knowledge at time equals zero or time equals midnight, uh, no problem. And then what the smartphone changed, which is revolutionary as of 10 years ago, but really changed in industry, is that if you can follow one person, you can essentially sample the data along a trajectory. So if you're doing underwater robotics or surface robotics, it's the same as Lagrangian hydrodynamics. You can essentially sample along the trajectory of the water or along your trajectory in the water if you have some propulsion. And of course, you can imagine that essentially before 2008, uh, all you had is the green and the black. And after 2008, when everybody has a phone, you also have a bunch of uh, the purple, or in sometimes if you do not, you, can, you can't track people all the time. It will drain the battery of the phone. So companies have gotten smart about this, but you can re-identify people. So you can say, oh, this person here at uh, roughly 1 p.m. is the same as this person there. So that's also information you can use for the inference. So the job of doing inference is essentially the job of reconstructing this color map, which for now we have forgotten, from that sample data along these trajectories. Um, and the way to do it is to use a constitutive model. So it's almost, um, if you're doing Kalman filtering, essentially you discretize your dynamics and you compute a quadratic approximate to your discretized dynamics. Um, here we're doing the same, except the constitutive model is a partial differential equation. So it's a bit harder mathematically. And because we cannot use approaches like Kalman filtering, we have to use um, a convex optimization uh, with a very specific way of discretizing that partial differential equation that is nonlinear uh, in a way that doesn't break convexity. And by the way, even though that equation looks simple, um, uh, Jean -Louis, no, uh, Pierre Louis Lyon got the Fields Medal um, for an 18 uh, for a 1982 paper that proves the existence and uniqueness of the solution of that equation, which in mathematical terms is not that old. So uh, prior to 82, there was no known solution that was existing and uniquely proven for that equation. So it's a relatively in mathematical timescales relatively new uh, thing here. And that's essentially what characterizes the dynamics I was talking about earlier. Um, so um, essentially, the job here is you take all this data, and from this data that I'm showing here, try to reconstruct the most likely solution in some form of quadratic error, given the constraints, the constraints is the, the, the PDE, and given the data, given that both the model is imperfect and the data is imperfect, like in typical uh, Kalman estimation. Um, the beauty of this is that we were the first to be able to pose this as a convex optimization program in which essentially if you characterize the uncertainty on both um, your uh, model and your data in some convex manner, so polygons, ellipsoids, or things like this, then solving that optimization problem is a convex program which can be solved very efficiently. In fact, your speaker next week will probably tell you a lot about it because Persimas, Persekas, and Tsitsitlis are three of the people who have pushed convex optimization through the last decade. So it's, as soon as it's convex, usually life is easy. Um, and in fact, we wrote the first book on this a few years ago, and we're in the process of writing the second part. Uh, and as soon as you have it, Larry, I will send it to you as well. Um, so how does it, so here's an example. This is actual GPS data. So every point here is a smartphone sending some information, location at a given time, and the color signifies essentially the speed. So you can see, and this is 2% of traffic. If 2% of you are sending one GPS point every three seconds, that's what it looks like, which almost reduces the need for inference to zero because you can almost read the map there, um, but that's not the point. Um, the point is that uh, if you did decimate this data and remove 99%, uh, would the algorithm still work? And the amazing thing is both this convex optimization approach and ensemble and Kalman filtering, which is a different approach, but, but uh, solve in half the same underlying problem, um, from that data, uh, we're able to essentially infer this, which is quite amazing because if you do then an error check um, just by quantifying the quadratic error between the estimate and the data, which was not used in the training and in the learning, um, it's actually quite good. 
And this is something we established about 10 years ago, which 10 years ago, if you think about it, was the beginning of the rise of the smartphone era. So people were really wondering, what's the magic number of people you should sample to get uh, perfect, whatever that means, traffic information. And so that, that became kind of the magic number for freeways, two to 5%, and then for arterials, it's a bit higher. Um, and of course now, uh, unless you're Google or Apple, you need these numbers. If you're Google or Apple, you don't, because you have so much penetration rate that um, you're using different techniques. Uh, but for the rest of the world, um, it's very important. And of course, that's work we started back in 2007. Now we have a nearly 100% penetration of uh, the smartphone um, uh, platforms and connected vehicles and just people traveling. Uh, so the game has changed. And that's why I was saying, like most of the work we did in Anfern way back when um, has kind of um, lost its signification uh, or significance because now it's, it's being part of technology. But when we did it, we were one of the first, so if you don't know what this is, this is a phone at the time when phones still had buttons. Um, uh, and um, uh, this, is, uh, this is before Google launched um, uh, essentially the, the Google Maps on arterials, we already were able to sample uh, enough to get uh, live maps for things other than freeways. Freeways had been populated by Google long before using these static sensors I was telling you earlier. That's how they, they jump started it. Uh, but they, of course, what, what happened is this. Essentially, within two years, uh, also, if you don't know what this is, this is a website. Um, and that's the way people used to look at traffic. Back in the days when they had no phones, they would go to the internet and uh, go to 511.org, um, look at the sensor data. That's what it looked like. So you can see it's not good. It's all green. And that is either obsolete or science fiction. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, and within two years, uh, that's what we did. And, and that's what the whole industry did. Um, uh, um, at the time. And so that was migrated to, um, so I'm going to skip a bunch of slides because I want to get to some more mathematical parts. We tried it, we did an experiment and so on and so forth. Um, for example, at the time, these are the 500 vehicles we were querying for San Francisco. So this is uh, the, the yellow cab taxi. If you don't know what a taxi is, that's the previous form of Uber. Um, and um, so uh, essentially, if you were sampling 500 vehicles at the 30 second rate, that's what it would look like. You can imagine uh, Uber today has 40,000 registered Uber drivers in just, in just in San Francisco, and each of them samples anything they do at probably a one hertz rate, just because you can see it moving on your phone and, and they need it for uh, ETA. So you can see that is already completely obsolete, but even with that, you can reconstruct the map in less than a day of data, and you can reconstruct a lot of the traffic features. So you can imagine how much the state of the art has moved forward since then. Um, what we did at the time is we built the first, uh, one of the first uh, traffic information system from a set of uh, feeds, um, then uh, filters, bottles. This is where the algorithm I just explained resides, and then we fed it back to our partners, mostly the DOT, and this is the time when Greg and I were working on the proposal together. Um, of course, now there's a clone of this at Apple, because the guy running Apple traffic uh, is the guy who built this, and then uh, received a phone call in 2009 from Apple before Apple had maps disappeared after his PhD. We never knew what he was doing until we figured out, okay, now we know what you're doing. Um, so I'm gonna skip that. So in, in, in terms of the industry history, this started in 2008, and this became very mature in 2011, and now this has become a commodity. And so this is where the second part of this talk starts, is like, okay, with this, we actually now realize we have built a Frankenstein. And here's why. So I'll just, oh, actually, this may be interesting. So in that whole history, we had to do modeling contributions, which is important because I think there's a lot of modeling happening at Metron for the type of inference work you do. We had to also do a lot of estimation contributions and not only statistical filtering, but also the convex optimization part I was talking about earlier. We had to prove it. We ran tests with 100 cars on freeways. I skipped that. Um, and then at some point, we even did procurement for the state of California. So this whole thing was a kind of a 10 years history, uh, which led to some pretty well-known domain now that, that is very mature. So now I'm going to talk about Frankenstein. So when you use Google in the morning to come here to work, if you commute, um, you do something like this. You query your uh, destination. So for example, you're going from um, Berkeley to that other school that we cannot speak the name of on campus um, on the other side of the bay. And usually it would give you what it thinks to be the shortest path at the time of query based on the data it has now and some really crappy forecast. Um, I'll tell you why it's crappy in a minute. Um, and because it will give you, because it wants to give you some notion of freedom, it will give you some equally valuable path that are usually within a few minutes of the shortest path or the fastest path. So you've all done that, that but I just want to remind that. So um, if we think about this in control theoretical terms, what does that mean? That means that it creates a feedback loop around the dynamics 
that is not known to anybody who is doing estimation. <clears throat> and that's a very bad thing if you do uh, any flight system uh, dynamics, you know that because essentially it's the same as building a controller for 747 and trade on a jet fighter. It's not gonna work if you have the wrong dynamics. Uh, but that's what's happening. So you could think, well, it's a bit of an academic construct here. Is that really, does it really matter? Um, it, and it does matter because you, you have to have your control gains adjusted to what your dynamics is. And I'll show you why it matters. Um, so first, everybody gets super excited. Um, this is a press release from Eric Gorsetti in 2015, uh, yeah, very obviously famous mayor of LA, um, together with Waze. And people assume that if you give people better driving directions, then of course, um, uh, things get uh, more efficient and, and society benefits. And then I'm gonna flip through these, but uh, essentially, so you can just read quickly, um, over the la next years, people started to notice that their neighborhoods experience a lot more traffic. In fact, probably a lot of you have experienced that. If you live in a neighborhood that is stuck between two freeways, you, you will see this. Like every time you go to Burbank from downtown LA, you will go through the, the residential neighborhoods um, to, you know, to avoid uh, freeway congestion. And um, so first, people thought it was kind of a bit of a you know, uh, problem with the app, but it's not a problem with the app. It's a much more complicated problem, and that's going to be the, 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 the part that we're interested in here. So, you know, I'm gonna flip through this. You probably have uh, experienced that. Um, then strange things started to happen. People started to defend themselves. So shaming people going through their neighborhoods with signs, um, uh, posting permanent semi-official signs there, posting fake detour signs to confuse them. <laughs> Um, the, the classic, there's also manuals on how to spoof them. So that some actually paid a senior citizen to walk with a phone on running the app to generate a fake GPS point of a car stuck in traffic. So essentially <laughs> it's injection of a fake data, a real fake data into a, a estimation model. Okay. Um, and and th this is insane, right? It's like normal people trying to defend themselves because their neighborhood is being ruined by this. Then of course, this is in my backyard, Fremont. Um, then cities got aware of it and got really upset. So for example, Fremont deprogrammed their traffic lights so that the travel time is multiplied by two in the city. That way people stay on the freeway and don't go through the city. So think about that process, right? You make your life miserable so people don't come to your place. I mean, <laughs> this is essentially what they're doing. And there's many ways to do that. You can deprogram traffic lights. Um, another way to do that is you can build stop signs, street bumps, anything that will increase your local travel time is going to essentially generate longer travel time on GPS, which is essentially gonna to try to get the app to route traffic around your neighborhood. This is a reality of city planning today, which is absurd. I mean, there's, there's gotta be better ways than in degrading your quality of life to prevent yourself, uh, to prevent this from happening. So getting rid of, uh, oh, blocking streets, very good. In Berkeley, all the streets are blocked now. You can't go through streets. Uh, preventing left turns or right turns at specific times of the, of the day and so on and so forth. So it's essentially a war, it's an urban war, which has started worldwide, it's not just the US, it's everywhere in the world. Um, and um, of course, at some point, uh, elected officials got involved too, because they realized, you know, this has got to stop. And of course, it's completely impossible to control because there's a lot of underlying um, issues about uh, equity, congestion pricing, it's illegal to actually toll uh, your city streets because you don't own it, or if you redo it, you can do it. Uh, so in some places in New Jersey, um, what they do is now the police issues tickets to people who are not from the city if they just go through the city. I don't even know if that's legal, but the police is doing it anyway. Um, and uh, I think what's, so uh, it's funny, this forecast finally happened. So Israel was the place where Waze was born and Israel was the first place where Waze was sued by a city. Um, and I think in a few years, just like for the opioids and their impacts on the cities, we'll probably have a class action against uh, these companies. And so this is, this is why I'm saying we created some form of Frankenstein. Um, so let me, and this is like cancer, it's everywhere. We're, we're writing, a, writing a book on it now, and we're trying to uh, inventory all the places where it has popped up in the media. Uh, knowing that the places where it happens is much larger, but at least it gives us a sense of the extent of the problem, which we have seen in China, in Europe, in Asia, and, and almost any place in the world. So let me explain why. This here, this movie shows a difference between if nobody was using the app, as opposed to if 20% of people were using the app. So imagine this accident. Um, if you did not have information, you'd probably stay on the freeway because you don't know where to go. But if you have the information, you leave the freeway. And if, you, if more and more people leave the freeway, 
Um, first, the app usually does not know when the accident gets removed because that's information from the CHP, the California Highway Patrol. So that the app will keep routing people until traffic clears. And what that generates is a complete plugging of that off ramp because people keep going this way. And what's insane about this is that now it creates more congestion on the freeway because it has created a bottleneck. So it has decreased the ability of the freeway to carry through traffic. So because of the information, freeway traffic is even worse as if uh, in comparison to a situation where nobody would have the information. And of course, all the residual traffic is routed into streets which do not have the capacity to carry it. A freeway lane carries about 2,000 vehicles per hour in California. Maybe this one carries 500 because of the traffic lights and the lower speeds, and the intersections are not programmed to do that. So that simple movie, which is an Amazon simulation, gives you a sense of why the, the essentially giving information in that way to people is not helping society. It's actually, the, it actually does crazy things too. It clogs the connectors, it clogs the other direction, I mean, just from accident in this direction. So um, now, you know, so uh, this is what I just described here. So obviously, this is not new. This was known. Uh, there's a very famous mathematician who got a Nobel Prize for proving this in a much broader context. Uh, and that's why, you know, the changing the dynamics uh, with the current control we have is, is not great. But the problem is you can't control it because anybody is free to use an app. And if the app doesn't give you what you want, you just use a better app. So we studied that. Um, and essentially, the type of results we came up with with uh, Nash equilibrium is that um, we, can almost, we can show that with an increasing percentage of people getting information, you converge to what's called a Nash equilibrium. So if you have static traffic, it's like rush hour, um, and you have people going this way, um, if no, nobody had the information, essentially people would stay on the freeway. And the more people get the information, the more they, they, they discover that you could use this street or that street. And so if you plot the travel time curve of uh, going from here to here, uh, you know, 10 years ago when nobody had the information, travel time on the uh, arterial streets would be 12 minutes, on the freeway would be terrible, it would be 20 minutes. And the more people got the app, essentially the more, so first street got clogged, second street got clogged, and essentially everybody got equally bad at the end. And now the freeway travel time is the same as the arterial travel time. That's one of the mathematical definition of the equilibrium, the Nash equilibrium. Um, so everybody is equally worse off as if they had collaborated. And so it's not new, right? John Nash got the Nobel Prize in 94 for it for a result which goes back to the 50s or 60s. Um, but that has been completely ignored by app providers and that elected officials might not even have an easy time to understand because intuitively, if you give people good driving direction, whatever good is, it should do better. But no, it doesn't, it's worse. And so the type of work we do is now we're trying to understand, you know, if these companies, Google, Apple, are learning over time, um, every day they learn, how should they learn? So what learning, what learning algorithm should they use um, so that we don't converge to a Nash equilibrium. And so what I'm going to show now is a slightly deeper deep dive into the math that identifies some classes of learning algorithms for which you could say, okay, if that's what they're using, then clearly that's going to converge to a Nash equilibrium and that's bad for society. So whatever you're using, Waze, Google, Apple, Enrix, Bing, your favorite routing app, all try to produce the same thing, which is a travel time which at the time of query is as good as it could be based on their travel forecast. And then they will allocate people in certain rounds. So you can view this as a sequence of different dynamics. If you're using Waze, you're doing this dynamic. If you're using Google, that's this dynamics. Apple is that dynamic. And now, every day, this happens. And then at the end of the day, the algorithm updates its data. It looks at how people were routed. It looks at their travel time. And it learned from the previous days. You've noticed over, over the last month, years, Google and Waze have changed the way they route you because they learn traffic patterns change. So the outcome is a travel time for everybody. And the learning algorithm is essentially a flow allocation law. So you, that you function, takes the allocation of the previous day, how good it did, how bad the travel time was, how good the travel time was, and produces a new allocation. And that works at a slow time scale from day to day. So the question, the mathematical question is, does that process converge? Can we even identify classes of learning algorithms for which we can say anything about what that algorithm will converge to over time. And so the online learning model is essentially, it's a repeated game setting. And in that repeated game setting, you allocate a flow um, 
every every day you look at how well you did you update your flow based on the law and that's the process and you can do it centralized decentralized stochastic deterministic it generalizes to a bunch of frameworks so first thing is what is it going to converge to and we kind of knew ahead of time that in most cases it will converge to a Nash equilibrium so we're going to define chi star as the set of Nash equilibrium um, and Understanding the convergence essentially amounts to saying, um, is there a set of laws U such that over time, the allocation of the flow converges to one point in the Nash equilibrium set? Because Nash equilibria are not unique, um, so it will converge to a Nash equilibrium. Um, and the definition of a Nash equilibrium is given here. It's saying that if this is your performance index, your vector, any deviation from it, from the equilibrium, is bad. So there is no incentive for you Google gives you the shortest path. It's going to make society converge to a very bad equilibrium. But if you are the good guy that decides to go to take the longer route, you pay for society. So there's no incentive for you personally to change your behavior. And that was what got John Nash the Nobel Prize. And that's the mathematical characterization of it. X minus X star is the deviation from the Nash equilibrium. So a first class of routing algorithms or learning algorithms that, that were identified is no regret algorithms. A no-regret algorithm is an algorithm which will allocate a flow compared to the best you could do if you always do the same. So th think about the vernacular definition of regret. Regret is you compare yourself to something else you could have done and did you do better? Yeah, great. No regret. Or did you do worse? Yes, you have a regret. So that's the mathematical definition. It's saying, imagine you apply always the same and you compare yourself, again, which the best same, you compare yourself to that, are you doing better or worse? So that's a no regret algorithm. And so if you assume that the learning laws of these algorithms is a no regret, which is a very wide class of algorithm, then what you can prove is that on average, flow allocations converge to a Nash equilibrium. So it's doubly bad. It's bad because it converts to a Nash equilibrium, but it actually doesn't even convert. It's on average, it's an average convergence rate, which means um, if you average everything you're doing over time, you're doing Nash. Uh, which means you could really have oscillations. Monday you use this freeway, it's terrible. So Tuesday you use that freeway, it's terrible. So now Wednesday you go back to that first freeway, it's still terrible. So you can see how on average you're Nash, but in reality you're oscillating. So, so if, if the learning classes used, which we don't know, right, because we don't look under Google's uh, hood or Apple's hood, um, you know, if the classes used are no regret, then it's really, really bad news. If the learning used is a bit more sophisticated, like you use a hedge algorithm, so something known in finance, where essentially your flow allocation at the next stage is what it was before with some kind of multiplier, which will be inversely proportional to how good you did or how bad you did. So if you did really bad, you put less on that on that link, and if you put if you were if you did good, you put more with some kind of a discount factor. Then what's amazing is that you can prove almost surely uh, that it, you can prove that it converges almost surely. Um, that's an algorithm used in, it's been used in finance for many years. Um, and there is a way to prove this with a concrete, you essentially use the replicator dynamics, you discretize it and you show that it corresponds to um, the hedge algorithm. And if you do that, then you can prove convergence uh, almost surely. So that means that, um, and the way you do it is essentially you discretize the dynamics, you prove that you stay within a ball of the continuous dynamics and that's the way you do it. But you have no convergence rate, so it's still bad news. Um, and that's just an example of the convergence. And now if you do make further assumption is that the learning phase is actually a step of a mirror descent of some convex function, which happens to be the Bregman, um, which happens to be the Orton potential, and you use the uh, Bregman divergence to do that mirror descent step, then you can prove much stronger results. Um, and so it's still a learning algorithm in which essentially you have a latency function at every step. Uh, and um, you do this mirror descent step, which corresponds to uh, kind of a more sophisticated flow allocation, but it still will converge to a Nash equilibrium. The thing you've gained in that process, oh, by the way, you can make it stochastic, you can decentralize it, it still works. Um, then what you've gained there is that essentially uh, you have a convergence rate and you have a, a speed of convergence and convergence proof. So still bad news. And so that's just the way it is. It's not our fault. It's not nobody's fault. It's just the fact that as long as people will keep using these apps, there's nothing you can do about it. And so that learning process will inevitably conduct uh, the whole system to converge at best to something that is not as good as system optimum. And there's a whole notion in economics called price of anarchy. Price of anarchy compares 
how good the system optimal is compared to what the Nash equilibrium is. Um, so the summary of that first part, and I'll have a second part with a little bit less theory, is at the core of the problem is you. You want the faster route because you want to go to work fast. That creates that loop that was not there 10 years ago, but now everybody has that loop. And that gets embedded in this, which is the way the system works. This is completely ill-equipped to solve that optimization problem. And that keeps changing essentially every day through time. And that's Google now versus Google six months ago versus Google um, six months from now. And essentially, that's accelerated by the fact that everybody in the US or almost everybody who's driving has a smartphone. Places like Silicon Valley are out of control. Like uh, there used to be a small startup when I was a student at Stanford. It was called Google. OK, now they have 40,000 people on the campus. Um, Tesla, 5,000 people in the factory. Next year, Treasure Island will open 18,000 units on the naval base. So that has us the forcing function because that makes uh, that go faster. Um, and so that plus demographic growth make that makes that process crucial because the system keeps learning and keeps converging to something you don't want it to converge to. So that was the first part. I have a much shorter part, so we'll switch the PowerPoint because it's so big and with the with uh, perfect. So the second part, if we can just play it, perfect. So essentially, what I have shown now is a set of models that are at this level. So you, know, you can model traffic at the one car level, multiple vehicle level, flow level, and then land use model, which are super big. So what I'd like to do is to go from this model to this type of models. In all the analysis we've done, we've not looked at individual vehicles in this dynamics. It's, it's more aggregated flows. And so this uh, movie that I showed a minute ago, which was obtained with uh, Imsan, that's the next level. That's the level where you model every vehicle. And that's where I would like to go now, because just like this repeated game framework showed what you can do with, um, with the learning uh, um, uh, through uh, repeat experiments, um, deep reinforcement learning by looking forward can do very different things which are quite exciting and, and we don't completely understand how they work. Um, so there's a lot of challenges in this one. This slide is messed up, I don't know why, but the rest are okay. Um, so the, uh, there's contributions to be made in data, in calibration, in model computation, and in control. And today I'm mostly going to talk about calibration, control, and computation. So um, I'll come back to that later. If you, if you like Star Wars, we also need to talk. Um, so this is historically the first measurement of a traffic jam ever. This is a picture of Bruce Greenshield in Ohio in 1935. There was some kind of agricultural tractor festival, which was enough to attract a couple hundred people. And a couple hundred people on these small roads was enough to create the congestion that was known. So he came with his uh, photographic um, material and kept taking pictures of traffic every couple minutes and created the first known traffic model ever in 35. Then later on, the hydrodynamics community in the 50s came up with partial differential equation models, which are essentially fluid models of traffic. In 2008, many years later, Japanese uh, scientists created that experiment, asking people to drive in circle at 20 miles an hour and keep your distance with the previous person. And if you've seen that movie, you know it. If you've not seen that movie, what's amazing is that you ask humans to do that simple task and it completely breaks down. If you keep watching this super boring movie, um, after a while, you'll see people stop and go and stop and go. And that's just the inability of the human to regulate a process um, that is not that hard. So that was in 2008. Okay, you can see that's pretty boring. So um, yeah, if you go to my website, you can play it accelerated. It's, it's, it's like watching traffic, you know, it's not very exciting. Um, so, 10 years later, Dan Work, who is a former student of ours, who is now a professor at Vanderbilt, did this experiment. Same experiment, except he inserted a self-driving vehicle in the ring, but this, so now it's just driven by a human, so inevitably, after a while, you'll see the same oscillations happening. So this is now in Arizona, so you can see people in Arizona or in Japan are equally unable to control something. Okay? <laughs> and then, at some point, the autopilot turns on, and magically, things smooth out. Wow. Um. One, one, one self-driving vehicle. 42% energy savings, and that's directly measured from the OBD2 port, so it's not modeled, it's actually measured. And, um, you know, it's, it's pretty remarkable. So it's like one vehicle every 20 vehicles is enough to smooth that out. Okay, so now, I'm going to, Kathy Wu, from our student of our group as well, who is now a professor at MIT, did this numerical experiment uh, in Sumo. 
So this is the self-driving vehicle. The only thing it can see is the person in front of it, so the blue vehicle, and it cannot see any of the white vehicles. So first, there's these oscillations. You see them. It's in simulation. And at some point, when the um, red car crosses this line, it turns on the autopilot. Um, I didn't say what the autopilot does. And it smooths things out. And same things happen. So now you might be wondering, well, if one of the students did an experiment in 2017 with real vehicles, why is another student in 2018 doing a simulation? And there's a major difference. The major difference is that this experiment was done based on physical models. If you're doing, if you're doing search on an aircraft or tracking, you, know, you have some dynamics. You have a model of the dynamics, and usually you know it explicitly through ODEs, through PDEs, through whatever you're using. And that's what you're using in your estimation routine and in your control routine. So what Dan Work did in 2017 with his vehicle is he took almost half a century of work of modeling cars. And there's thousands of models of car following models, uh, car intelligent driver models, there's all kinds of models. Found one of them, managed to write a controller that stabilized the system. In 2018, Kathy did the same with no model using deep reinforcement learning, black box deep reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. And it actually beat the first algorithm. So what you see here is a policy, a deep reinforcement learning policy, that does the same thing as the previous movie, except it has no model of anything. Mm -hmm. All it has is access to a simulator. It can learn through simulation, but it does not know the dynamics. And that's the beginning of a completely new era. Because essentially, it took like 10,000 articles to probably come up with good models of traffic. Once these guys did their experiment, there's probably 1,000 articles just on that experiment. You can look phantom jams. MIT even invented a term for it, jamitons. Um, there's thousands of articles, and then Dan made it work. And then within one article, you can beat that algorithm, except you didn't need a model. And that's really strange. So I'm going to show you now Lego blocks to see how, where that could go. Every movie I'm going to show in the next five minutes is going to use the same color coding. You have essentially a self-driving vehicle. And the only thing it can see is it can see the blue vehicles wherever they are. And the connected vehicle, or you have some link, radar, whatever you want. And then there's a bunch of other white vehicles, and you cannot see them. And so for example, if you teach the algorithm to stabilize a double ring, it's doing like what any jerk would do, right? Like the person essentially prevents you, you from passing. So, OK. And it's, but it manages to stabilize two rings. And the beauty is you never give it any lean model change or anything. It just learned to do it. We, we don't know that anybody has done that with actual explicit models. I mean, it's not rocket science, but people, people have failed to do it because usually you model lean switching with a Boolean variable. And as you know, that explodes in any optimization routine. Um, so you could argue, but that's not really, you know, you learn this in police academy. So you know, if a policeman could do it, then you know, what's, <laughs> no, we have a lot of policemen in my family, so we take this very seriously. Um, so um, what about intersections? So stuff like that. Um, so this is what happens if you have no control. What happens is essentially very inefficient, right? People will stop. Oh, you go, I go, you go, I go. This is the most inefficient way of dealing with intersection traffic. If you actually uh, teach the algorithm to deal with that problem, what it does, it, I'll narrate it, but it doesn't know what it's doing. It's essentially creating a snake by finding the right speed at which the length of the snake will be such that it maximizes, you can see, right when the snake. <laughs> now, I can explain this to you, uh, but of course, it does not have a model of it. All it has is the ability to do simulations. As black box, yeah. So what's the, what's the underlying reward function? So for that particular one, it's throughput of the intersection. And the reward function will change based on the scenarios. For example, the ring, you want the total VMT to be as big as possible, and you might have some additional penalty for oscillations. So you have to change the reward function based on every uh, scenario. And here, what it did is it, does, it just rediscovered platooning, essentially. But you never taught it what a snake is. You never taught it what a platoon is. It just, it's called an emergent behavior. It's something known in, in machine learning. So here is another example, which is more complex. Now you have this intersection, and you want to reward the throughput at this intersection. So right now, people are just taking turns like in the previous case. Um, and now if I do look at what happens when I insert self-driving vehicles, it's very hard for me to, in good faith, narrate what it's doing. I mean, I could invent some uh, you know, uh, fake news channel type style narration here where I explain to you what it's doing. But the truth is, it's really not clear what it's doing. So it's an interesting case where there's probably no explicit solution anymore. Or it's very hard to solve with classical control and optimization. But deep reinforcement learning will just do it. Um, so then what you can do with it is even in more interesting. What if you learn on the ring and apply it to a scenario it's not seen before? So it's called transfer learning. 
uh, you can show convergence. So here's an example of a situation it has never seen before, where you have a merge onto a uh, freeway, and that merge will create these shock waves that I was talking about earlier, right? So a few more merges, and you will see it will start to seriously clog. Like now, this is steady, and then one more, and now it's you can see this is bad propagating. So if I do insert uh, a few self-driving cars with a policy to learn on the ring, watch the red cars as they enter. You see this is already starting to slow down because it's sense there's something in front. This is not slowing down too much because there's no much congestion. And watch the next one. It essentially learned to be a red light. It, the algorithm taught a car to be a red light. And, but you can show it actually maximizes a throughput. Another emergent behavior. Um, now, these things um, are interesting because uh, they will change the way traffic is managed. This is an experiment that Dan Work ran in Tennessee um, a few months ago. Here, what they try to demonstrate is that if you use adaptive cruise controls uh, linked to each other, it creates instabilities um, that essentially backpropagate. So um, it's also a boring movie, so I won't show you the whole movie. Essentially, all these cars are different brands. They all run an adaptive cruise control model. And at some point, the last guy that was Dan uh, has to oscillate between 40 miles an hour and 70 miles an hour to keep up with the caravan. And so essentially what it leads to is, you can see these, um, uh, okay. and at some point the last, uh, it's disengaged because it's too dangerous. Um, so you can see there is an actual, so people think, okay, just in the same way with the phones that uh, did a better job at routing, it actually did a worse job. ACC in general is gonna be worse. ACC is gonna make things worse. And that's what we're trying to fix now. And that's not an easy job. Um, so the examples I was showing here is uh, it, it tried to fix that. Essentially, it learned to it learned from the ring that if it senses something earlier, it has to slow down, and it's essentially um, this kind of red light behavior. And what we showed is that with a up to 10% of self-driving vehicle on the freeway, you could probably smooth traffic um, quite easily, which is crazy because the energy savings would probably be 20% uh, for five-lane freeway. That's quite quite uh, enormous. And so this was picked up by Science Magazine. And typically, you know, the, the typical target here of opportunity is there's these phantom jams that I'm sure you've been in. It's like, you know, go fast, go slow, you don't know why, and it will self-propagate forever. And that's just the inability of the human uh, to self-regulate. So, so, of course, we'll go further with that and, and try to do uh, things like Baybridge, which are way more complex. And here the notion is that in mobile traffic control, um, if you have cars essentially slowing down at the appropriate pace, you can maintain capacity without uh, degrading the level of service. And of course, this is gonna create road rage, right? Because you have an empty car or a car in front of you which has white space and he's holding you. Um, so <laughs> it's gonna be a cultural shock, but think about the first time someone saw a traffic light in the 30s and had to stop at an empty intersection. I mean, in most countries, people obey traffic rules and probably in a few, maybe in a decade, this will become a traffic rule. It's, there will be flow pacifiers and that's the type of work that, that we're interested in this. It's a flow pacifier. So we've tried this at the University of Delaware. They have built a mini city where we can, uh, you can experiment with vehicles, so to try it on hardware. Um, so an example here is another scenario where the blue cars are the automated cars. Um, this is no machine learning, this is with the reinforced learning. And here, if you have the reward function be the throughput, you can see that in that case, the Hummer vehicle is the last vehicle and it will exit earlier on this part of the movie than on this part of the movie, that vehicle, essentially because it managed to time the vehicles properly. That's another thing it learned on the ring without knowing anything about the intersection. And so as we speak, we're now trying this on experimental vehicles, which we hope to run on the road soon, but you can imagine that the uh, authorizations from the DOTs are a bit uh, complicated to obtain because that's uh, you know, gonna be complicated. So the, the similarity with the previous part of the talk is that in reinforcement learning, um, it's like repeated games, except you look forward in time. The repeated games tries to optimize some function or is a sequence by which you do an optimal control step at every step, and you can prove some, um, some optimality of some sort. The deep reinforcement learning is the same thing forward with the reward function you try to achieve, uh, in which essentially at every step you have an action that you uh, do in your environment. So this is our simulator. It pops up a reward and it pops up a state, and based on that you decide what to do. So the last thing I would like to leave you with today for the last three minutes of this talk is that I'm gonna now commit a second crime. The first crime was to get rid of the model. In the very first part of the talk, everything we did is model-based. PDEs, ODEs, the, the good old classical stuff with you know, optimization and control. And then we got rid of it by replacing it by a simulator. Now I'm gonna do the second crime. What if I also decided to throw the state in the garbage? 
because when we learn in the environment, in everything I've shown you, it pops up the state. I know where my vehicles are, I know where the speed is, whatever it is, and I, that's what I use to compute my reward function. So I still have access to the state. I don't know how it's computed, it's a pure black box thing, but I have access to it. So my last crime of the day is now I'm gonna kill this guy. And how do I do that? What if instead of learning from the state, I learned from a picture of the state? So it's now learning from the rendering of the state. So the amazing part is that if you get rid of that state and just used a pixel-based representation of it, you can almost achieve the same performance as if you were learning from the state in some cases, not all cases. The complexity is unchanged regardless of the number of agents because now it's a, you're learning from a picture. Um, and of course, uh, it opens a lot of different uh, avenues. So regardless of how we did it, um, what's amazing is that now the, this, this mini city thing I showed, in order to achieve the same level of optimality, all I need to do is to render it, learn from it, and essentially do the same as I was doing before. And furthermore, we were trying to show that you could also do it decentralized. I don't need to have a helicopter view of the whole thing. If I just had access to what every vehicle sees, I could do the same. Now, of course, here you lose some optimality. There's no free lunch, but that's also possible. Now, why, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because down the road, um, you've seen these pictures before, right? I mean, machine vision has progressed so fast that now segmentation is possible. Uh, inference of relative vehicle speed is possible. And putting a cell phone on every light pole, it's not difficult. Putting a camera, I mean, 10 years or 15 years ago, London already had 1 million cameras. Uh, now, I don't know, there's probably tens of millions of cameras in London. So the point is, if you were able to learn from this through deep reinforcement learning, then essentially the second crime I committed becomes very helpful because now we don't need to do inference. Like there's a lot of people, and if you're doing flight dynamics, you need to do that inference. If you're doing an autopilot, you need that inference. But if you're doing the type of multi-vehicle control I'm showing, you don't, I don't need to know how fast that car is going if I could learn directly from watching that car. And now that's not gonna happen right away. There's a lot of technical problems. So this we can learn from, this we cannot learn from today. And that's probably gonna be the next frontier of, 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 of the learning we do. So uh, in um, closing, it's a bit of a gruesome picture, but you probably have remember, you've probably seen these videos on, on YouTube of um, uh, true learning applied to um, various problems such as video games. So not so long ago, um, we were, people were able to train algorithms uh, and in 10 minutes of training, uh, essentially from just watching the rendering of the Atari game, you can learn to play. So it's not playing very well. And if you are my age, you probably played with that when you were a kid. And when you play with that when you were a kid, you know it's pretty hard. Um, what's amazing is that the learning algorithm, your true learning, which is the same as your learning, what we're using, um, it's not using the state space, it's just using the pixels. It's learning on the pixels. And after a while, it becomes very proficient, and at some point, it starts to beat uh, the human. It, it knows how to create a, a, a tranche to get the ball stuck on the tap and destroy it faster. And the same thing with a uh, Pago, it just beats a human with very unintuitive ways of doing it. So we believe traffic will be the next activity what we're after. And if in the process, doing it from end to end pixel learning is uh, possible that it will open a lot of new applications that were never really thought about before. So you can watch these videos, they're, they're quite a lot. Um, that's the algorithm we showed before. Um, if you're interested, we have an open framework, you can download it. Um, it's open source, uh, there's no restriction. Um, it specifically uses two micro simulators, Sumo, which is also open source, or if you prefer working with a corporate solution, Emson, which is built by TSS and now part of Siemens, if you have a license. And essentially what it does is it enables you to use the deep reinforcement learning libraries uh, on the AWS cloud and uh, use the state-of-the-art micro simulator. Because I don't want to be in the business of building a micro simulator. I want a local expert in traffic. I never took any traffic classes. I don't know anything about traffic. I want a traffic expert to build that and I want to be able to use it as a black box in my deep reinforcement learning framework. And I think it's a paradigm that is changing too because probably in a lot of the applications you're doing, um, there exist good simulations uh, based by experts, so you could probably use them to, 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 to do that same type of learning. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, it's gonna take time. You start, it's like Legos, you know, you, you get more and more complicated sets. So these are the building blocks of the Legos we're, we're using. There's issues of scalability. There's a lot of issues. Um, but um, we're creating a community of people that can use this. Um, we're creating benchmarks. If you do robotics, you've probably heard of Mujoko. Uh, Mujoko 
Um, actually, how many of you know about Mujoko? Okay, so Mujoko is a framework that um, you can use to compare your algorithms on humanoids and all kinds of robots. So there's an example of a robot that learns how to walk, uh, and you can see it's initially it's failing, and at some point it will start to walk really fast, and then you can benchmark the algorithms against each other. Uh, yeah, so it's a bit strange at the beginning, but you know, it'll, it'll do better over time. Um, so just like Bujoku has created a bunch of uh, benchmarks that are used by the robotics community to compare the algorithms, um, we are uh, doing the same for traffic. Uh, we're doing workshops. The next workshop we're doing is in Nice in France. Uh, if you'd like to be on the Riviera in the winter uh, and your sponsor allows it, um, then, uh, then uh, we're going to do a one-day teaching on this. And these are our partners, so uh, we're very excited. Uh, if you're interested in this, it's, it's all on the web, and we're very excited to work with you. Um, so I think with this, I'm going to stop um, and uh, essentially um, hand it over again to um, Larry. Uh, so again, I want to thank uh, uh, people for the invitation. Uh, very excited to be here. Um, and I think we're opening it now for questions. Yes, we are. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, you said you wanted to do away with state. State, please. State. Uh, but that the state means a state for each car? Yes. So now you go for the pixel, which is broader. And it's, it's, it's a state, but it's not the same state. Uh, exactly. So maybe my, maybe my statement sounded almost too political. Um, so we don't want to get rid of the state space. We want to change the state space. And the state space, yeah, yeah, oh, uh, yeah, yeah absolutely. So it's a semantics. Essentially, we've made the state space into a set of pixels rather than abstract quote variables okay. inherited on physical models. So each point on each pixel that is lit up is a vehicle. Uh, well, it's, a, it's, it, it's, it's part of the vehicle, right? But I mean, yeah. yeah. It, yeah. Each pixel is something that that you've learned from. So in the very first and clean rendering we're using, it's the rendering of a vehicle. So for example, the purple arrow is a vehicle and the black is just the background. But one day, hopefully, when we learn from real um, uh, video data, not rendered uh, simulation data, I don't know, it could learn from a lot of other things like reflection of the sun on the vehicle or, you know, whatever it is, and we don't know. Yeah, um, have you thought at all about um, adversarial attacks? Uh, some of the recent machine learning, you know, change a few pixels and it thinks a stop sign is a go fast sign. Um, and, whether, and how to protect against vulnerability to that? Yes. Um, and actually, it's funny you're mentioning the stop sign because um, six years ago, Google used um, Google Earth and Street View to scrape the entire world for stop signs. Uh, a student of mine did that as an intern at Google, and they a lot of a lot of strange things. Um, so uh, it's like stop, and then they put the name of the president or stop, whatever. So there's lots of strange things. Um, so yeah, adversarial learning, uh, and as we call it in uh, in control theory, uh, either the the old days uh, differential games of Rufus Isaacs. Um, or now robust, um, all the same. So adversarial inputs, the way you look at it, uh, regardless of the way you look at it. Um, yeah, that is a very good concern. So first, we've not looked at it yet because we're just scratching the surface. Um, uh, two comments. We will have to take care of it because it's very easy to fake video and we see it from the deep fakes, but it's even simpler to, to fake the types of video we have. Um, the second thing which is very important is none of what we're doing touches the safety critical layers of the vehicles. So in other words, the safety critical layers of the vehicles is still the good old uh, PID controllers or robust controllers, uh, model predictive based, uh, model based, because um, machine learning is notoriously uh, famous for failing in corner cases, especially anything to do with deep neural nets. You don't know what it's learning. And even though explainable AI will at some point probably shed some light, I don't think we're there yet. So the worst thing that could happen if we are, quote, hacked, or if someone manages to inject some fake data, whether it's video, whether it's pixel-based, whether it's even model-based or state-based, based, um, is yeah, it's going to create a bigger traffic jam. So not cool, uh, but hopefully nobody dies. Um, and by the way, um, uh, there is a lot of spoofing of, in the first part, I only spoke about a very specific set of spoofings that people are doing to defend themselves against ways. Uh, but there's a much broader uh, class of spoofing attacks that have been um, experience either in simulation or reality in the transportation world. The most famous one was actually um, some students from Technion 
created um, a bunch of virtual accounts in ways in the early days of ways where you could still have uh, virtual accounts and they created a traffic jam in the middle of the desert with cars that did not exist it's not like the you know a grandpa walking with a with a with a phone to pretend his cars they actually created fake gps data that they injected in sideways and then created a monster traffic jam in the middle of the desert and then they called ways to tell them hey by the way we just hacked you it's just for fun for our research don't don't get mad <laughs> <laughs> and they made the news <laughs> that way so it is a real concern uh, and it's always this coming cat and mouse play, right? And I think um, right now we're just playing uh, mouse, I guess, and we have to learn to fight the cat. <laughs> um, I like the fact that you can insert an autonomous vehicle to control traffic. And I was wondering if uh, Tesla is doing anything of that sort with their self-driving and how that might impact the traffic in the Bay Area. So let me give a preface. If I knew, I couldn't tell you. Um, you've, I'm sure you've used that line before, um, many of you, um, but uh, think about it this way. So Eugene Vinitsky, who is one of the students who did the smoothing of the flow, uh, just came back from working on the Tesla Autopilot uh, program for the last uh, half year. Um, when you are on 280 in California, relatively smooth freeway, and you engage the Autopilot, it never tells you how it selects the speed. Does it select the free, flay, the free flow speed, which is way above the speed limit? Does it select the posted speed limit, which officially is 65 miles an hour, or does it select something else below? And that's completely impossible for the user to understand. Um, so what I'm trying to say with that very general statement that does not only apply to Tesla, but a lot of other companies, is that um, today Tesla has the ability to roll this out in a week by just doing a software upgrade on their autopilot. And Tesla is one of the few companies that can do that. Like Daimler, it's harder for them because their software architecture does not allow it as easily. But Tesla, they can do it. They can push this in a week. Um, and so um, uh, if I was, now these two statements I just made are public statements. So if you put the two and two together, it's easily to construct a scenario in which they could be doing it already in places where they have enough cars. Uh, whether they're doing it in reality, whether they're experimenting with it, um, you would have to ask their PR person. I'm sure they'll tell you beautiful stories. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it seems like if, if car, individual cars can control traffic less so much, you could talk to someone like a, like a Google Maps and say, all right, expose some parameters uh, uh, in your system, like let us make recommendations on those parameters. And if you cooperate, you know, we'll give you parameters that'll help traffic flow and help you versus your competitors who aren't you know, supplying any parameters. So it seems like you could, you know, anything they choose to expose, you don't even have to know the internals, you know, you could. Uh... And that's very important because the internals will always be the default excuse that all of these companies use to not give you the data. They say, oh, we can't do it because of privacy, which is, I mean, okay, if you work five minutes in privacy, you know that's not true, but okay. Um, uh, but that's gonna be the legal excuse. So the, um, if what you said was applied, there would be a major problem with the users, that's us. Because, um, so to smooth traffic, no problem. Smooth traffic is such small time scales that a lot of people, like you said, might not even notice, uh, okay, the car is going 60 instead of 65. I think that, that people won't, won't care as much. But routing is a problem because as soon as there is a, com a competitive app that gives you a more selfish route, which is better for you, you have no incentive to stay on the platform that is doing the good for society. And that's, that's the way it is. And so um, the cure of this is essentially congestion pricing, like is done in Singapore, where you can, trade, um, you can trade time for money, you can trade time for access. So for example, um, if on 101 there is a lane that is a fast lane because it's a HOV3, guaranteed travel time, you will trade travel time for convenience. It sucks to be with other people in the car, but you go faster. And in the same way, uh, with congestion pricing, um, in some cases, you might want to take a longer route for a smaller fee, and that's bridge tolling has done that in the past. Okay, well, I'm suggesting something a little different, though, in that if you uh, if you score the parameters that like a Google Maps provides, like if the Google Maps cars are actually doing oh. well for society, then you can give them preference over the Waze cars and stuff like that. But who is you? There's a central. Ah, okay, of, all right. So we go back. No, no, totally. And so, and in fact, I think this is the future. In the future, so say five years from now, we will see self-driving districts like um, San Francisco, New York, Washington. No, because it's crazy. 
um, it's too crazy. But Naom in Saudi Arabia, <coughs> city being built from scratch, they will probably build a self-driving district. They will just build a, a district where you cannot go if you don't have a self-driving car with some features. Um, now, in that context, the, the way to do it is exactly the way you suggested. Essentially, you want to deal with traffic flow the way air traffic deals with, with, with airlines. Of course, in air traffic, it, it's, there's a bidding process. It's not optimal. It's also inherited from legacy. But in road traffic, it's going to be designed from scratch because it doesn't exist. And then you could do exactly what you're saying. The more, the more efficient routing is given to specific providers in exchange for some commodity, in that case, road capacity, and so on. Um, I think we're going to see this within five years in some places in the Middle East, which have, you know, they're building Hyperloop already in uh, the Emirates. So th this, I think, will happen in Saudi Arabia. Um, I think for the rest of the world, it's, I mean, it's going to be a bit more complicated because there's a lot of other factors that, that intervene. But I, I mean, ideologically, um, when we talk to places in the Middle East, that's what we're suggesting to do because I think that's the right way to do it. That'd be ideally, ideologically aligned with the Middle <laughs> it could be very lucrative uh, depending on uh, your destination or very problematic if you chose the wrong destination <laughs> as you know as you know yes i would say um kind of a comment slash question uh question is are you are you trying to address this the comment is, are some of the things that i saw as um, potential issues with the, the research that was presented um so so these uh, the agents you showed interacting these models uh, were fairly idealized agents, and they don't exhibit a lot of the behaviors that people exhibit, um, in the sense that if if someone tries to slow down and control traffic in a real situation, and people do that, right? People literally try and do that sometimes, um, and often results in an aggressive response from other drivers, um, and they will take actions to be able to uh, reassert their freedom of the road. <laughs> Um, and, and I didn't, we should put an amendment in the Constitution, by the way, because that's coming up too. Right? Yeah. I didn't see any of that happening in these models. That seems like that would cause a, a major breakdown, potentially cause larger issues when you, you cascade more accidents and now you're causing road closure, road, right, you know, road conditions. Yeah, no, uh, so absolutely. Um, um, and I was going to say, and then I'll give you the second part of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, people also <laughs> react in much larger time scales uh, through policy. Yeah. And so, um, a good example of that is, um, I think that Waze is the reason why the Waze slash Google, uh, uh, yeah, okay, other ones, uh, is the reason why the I-66 corridor going into DC is finally able to expand. Because for uh, the better part of two decades, um, Arlington County uh, prevented the expansion of the I-66 interstate uh, way into, the, uh, into uh, DC because among other reasons, um, it, it drives up their property value if it's painful to try and drive uh, through that area. And so if you live in Arlington, you don't have to worry about the I-66 trafficking and it makes it easier. So Arlington had very little uh, reason to accept some local uh, property uh, seizures, I guess you'd say, eminent domain cases to be able to allow for the expansion of the I-66 corridor which would be better for everyone, but when all the traffic got rerouted into their neighborhood and all of a sudden 50 and every other road in Arlington Suddenly they were all for it. Was, was terrible, they're like, oh, now that we share the Nash equilibrium, we, we, want, we want this fixed. Um, so, okay, absolutely. Uh, so st st uh, let me start with the last question uh, first. Um, so in a sense, what you're saying is that Waze created so, much problem, so many problems in Arlington that essentially Arlington embraced it. Uh, well, embrace, why they embrace the expansion yeah. of the they, they, yeah. they agreed yeah. to yes. finally allow a more optimal right. traffic system to be built right. yeah. because they shared the pain. Yeah, so, okay, this is unfortunately the way reactive policy works in most of the countries, including the U.S., is that uh, Waze, cre Waze, whatever, I mean, Waze, Uber, I mean, you've seen the Uber de Blasio uh, issue in New York, a completely different problem. Um, so, yeah, the technology will create some major disruption that will steer policy. In the current context, if I understand, because I'm not familiar with the 66, is that the, the, the current impact on the policy is finally elected officials have allowed or pushed for the expansion of the 66 freeway more capacity. So for short term, it's a good thing because it will decongest freeway. By the way, it will, there's no free lunch. It's going to push the congestion somewhere else, but okay. At least mm -hmm. locally, um, it will decongest freeway. Um, and in the long term, it's not good because it doesn't fix the demand problem. Congestion is mostly driven by demand, and it's fixed by a local authority. 
Um, so it's interesting. You can see the different time scales, right? And space scales. The Arlington has a problem. So Arlington um, unlocks a veto it had put on that. They expand. They probably will fix the problem. For a few years, it will fix the, the problem of through traffic in Arlington, push the problem somewhere else. So same will happen in some neighborhood nearby. And at some point, demand will reestablish itself by what's called induced demand or latent demand. Essentially, when traffic flows, then more people drive. That's that's a known phenomenon. So you don't want, as a as a traffic engineer, you don't want to smooth traffic too much because otherwise people drive and then it's worse. Um, <laughs> so people use my products. Yeah, no, I know, I know, I know. We have to put an additional amendment in the constitution. But uh, okay, so um, uh, so so it's interesting. So I think this is going to have a positive effect initially, and then things will happen. Um, but I think what's sadder what's sadder about this is that um, it takes the technology to significantly disrupt something for elected officials to do something about it. And if you think about Singapore, Singapore acted proactively on this with a ERP program, the congestion pricing program. Uh, and I don't have time to explain this today, but the point is there are other ways where you can almost prevent these things from happening by uh, policy or by urban design, like the place where I live in Piedmont in California was designed in a way that it's no matter what the way you look at it, it's always faster to go around. So traffic engineers in the 20s, for other social reasons, did not run through traffic, nothing to do with waste because it was in the 20s, um, and essentially built the city so that you, it's, it's always better to drive around. So the second, so we're writing a book on it, and so maybe I'll ship Larry a box now. <laughs> when the book comes out, I'll just, uh, in recognition and, and with gratefulness for your invitation today, I'll try to ship a bunch of books there. Um, the first part is very interesting because essentially, yes, you're going to have road rage, if you have a car slowing traffic on purpose and people are societally not ready for it. Um, so when we speak about this with elected officials, uh, I mean, this is still science fiction and this is not gonna happen uh, right away. Um, you know, if these were robo cars or cars with police attendants doing this, nobody would, nobody would raise a finger, right? They will just, okay, the police is doing this. Um, so the way, yeah, so in most countries, uh, in the Middle East, going back to our conversation, I've seen people getting out of their car and yelling at the police for giving them tickets. Yeah. And because they're from special families, the police apologize and take the ticket back. Uh, but okay, <laughs> other than these cases of disobedience, um, you know, if it's done by the police, um, uh, uh, then okay. So um, mm -hmm. now you take Tesla, going back to your analogy, I do not have data, but if you go to Sandy Hill Road, which is the exit for all the VC firms uh, in Silicon Valley, um, at morning peak hour, you probably might already have over 20% of the vehicles being Teslas, just because it's a very affluent era. Uh, and I'm sure some pockets of Washington are probably similar. Um, so if this is happening at large enough scale, it might not even be noticeable anymore. I mean, the cases I've shown are a bit outrageous because there's a lot of space, uh, but at larger scale, it might not be as noticeable. So the, the, the short answer is, the way this will be societally acceptable is unclear. Uh, there will be people who do, in fact, have more aggressive driving behavior because of this. We do not have this in our models. These models exist. Uh, there is lots of models of road rage. Probably there's PhDs written on road rage, um, but uh, we don't have them inside our models yet. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, there's something to learn from history. I mean, I think uh, there's a lot of traffic violations today. The traffic rules are here, but traffic are violated all the time. Um, so there is a notion of how will traffic rules be violated when mobile traffic control happens. And this is new. We don't know. And so it's a big question mark. So Alex, one, well, one more question. One more question. Okay. So before we check the audience, no. anything online? No. No. Okay. So one more question from the audience. Shut up. Shut up. Oh, no, no. We have one more. <laughs> there we have one more. Um, my last question is, uh, mentioned at the end the uh, ability to identify objects in the learning system. Uh, do, you, do you foresee a distributed architecture for cars communicating with one another and coordinating traffic at a local level without having to go to a higher authority? Okay, this is a phenomenal question. Um, so I'm really glad this is the last question, but, but this is a phenomenal question. Uh, um, so um, the sensing is distributed because the way these are collected, you take your typical Tesla, it has six cameras, or probably more, but three front facing, three side and, and back facing. So the sensing is distributed. Uh, with Tesla, everything is centralized. Obviously, the data is shared. Not everything is transmitted, but a lot of it. Um, the way the policies we are building are constructed, like the one I showed for the bridge, they are distributed. So the notion would be in an ideal world, and I'm only saying ideal world, 
The policy is learned offline or is learned in some fashion, is uploaded into the car once for all or updated over time, and in order to function only needs local data. So local data could be local speed, the density of vehicles around me, maybe a few other parameters. And in an ideal case, they would not need to talk to each other because the implementation is easier. You don't have to have network failures, latency problems, all that stuff goes away. Um, for traffic management, I think it's possible because we're at slow time scales. It's minutes. It's not microseconds like autopilot, it's minutes. Uh, and the, scale, the space scales are half a mile, a mile, so these are large uh, scales. So I believe that for traffic smoothing and for traffic flow management, um, we will not need V2V, which is a major advantage, because then you have, otherwise you're just stuck with the auto industry and then you're on five-year cycles and it's your worst nightmare. Um, I think for more aggressive type of control, it might be a problem. And that's why right now, my group is just focusing on traffic management at large scale, because first we think it's very low hanging fruit, for energy, uh, but also we think that um, uh, the implementation challenges are a much easier uh, level of entry. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Alex, I want to thank you for, oh. and, and from uh, all the folks at Metron and our guests for coming up and joining us today. Well, thank Fantastic you. talk. Thank you for the invitation. And, I'm yeah. really honored to be here. Yeah. So thank you. Now, what I learned last night in, uh, over dinner with Alex is that there's another policy he has to ensure his optimum flow that he didn't talk about today. He takes the train. <laughs> and so when you next time you're on the train, oh, and and uh, and you're having all the now now um, you, you have an opportunity to think about and do other things other than the road rage in front of you. Uh, I've got a little Metron notebook for you. Oh, thank you. And uh, because our trains not, may not always be up to the same standard as they are in France, we've also got a power pack when the power goes out at your seat. Oh, seats. thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.